I'm really honored to be chairing this panel. Uh, I know we've already sort of covered some of the terrain that we're going to talk about today, but just to reinforce the message, I think there's broad agreement that the United States is second to none in the world in producing innovations to improve human health, and probably second to none in the world in terms of our lousy ability to ensure equitable access to those innovations and discoveries. The question of how we get those innovations into the hands of people who need them but perhaps can't afford or access them um, is the problem that we've asked today's panelists to focus on. They're each specialists in their own way in the delivery of innovation and understanding what the barriers are to making that happen in the United States and globally. I'll introduce each of them as they come up to the mic, um, but we have two panelists who represent academic perspectives, Drs. Maria Polyakova and Stacy Dusatzina, and two who bring perspectives from industry, Drs. Cooper and Washington, so I know we're going to have a very rich discussion. Dr. Polyakova is going to kick off today. She is my colleague in the Department of Health Policy an economist by training, she's an assistant professor of health policy, and her research focuses on questions surrounding the role of government in the design and financing of health insurance systems, and she's especially interested in how public policies uh, interact with individual decision-making in healthcare and health insurance, as well as in risk protection and redistributive aspects of health insurance systems. So she's ideally situated to talk to us today about the role of insurance coverage in ensuring access to innovations. Dr. Polyakova, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Michelle, for the generous introduction. Um, so as Michelle mentioned, we've heard a lot about the development and innovation in the medical technology space. And the question we're going to think about now is how do we actually get all of these great innovations to people? As many of you have potentially worked not only in the R&D space in medical technologies, but also in trying to bring technologies to the market, we know that technology adoption and diffusion is a complex process driven by many factors. So one persistent fact that we have seen in, uh, documented in some research, and people kind of have a, a general intuition that this is true, is that diffusion of medical technologies tends to uh, be very unequal across the income distribution. So novel medical technologies tend to arrive much later in lower income households. This lag in technology adoption, in fact, has been speculated to contribute substantially to the very persistent observation that people at higher income levels have better health in many contexts, in many countries, including countries with universal health insurance coverage. So what is remarkable about the US, however, is that um, not only we have this suspicion that this diffusion may be particularly unequal, but we actually don't have the data to really ascertain whether or not this is true because the US lacks data that would connect detailed administrative records of healthcare utilization with records on the socioeconomic status of households. So today, to first give you some facts about the, how unequal medical technology diffusion can be, I'm going to um, show you some results from my own research together with uh, a colleague here at Stanford, uh, Petra Persson, as well as two wonderful students who are both present here, and you'll see some of their research um, later in the, in the student section, um, where we're, we're going to use rich administrative data from Sweden, where we're able to link tax record and healthcare records for the whole population to examine the diffusion of one particular technology, and that is going to be the assisted reproductive technology. So um, here in this slide, on the x-axis you see years, and on the y-axis you see a measure of diffusion of assisted reproductive technology, primarily driven by IVF in Sweden um, by the uh, in, uh, quintile of the income distribution. So what you see here are two things. One is, in general, technology diffusion is relatively slow. So when IVF became somewhat common in the, in the late 1990s, Today, we have about 6% at the top of the income distribution, about 2% of the Swedish population in the bottom of the income distribution of Swedish, I'm sorry, babies and births, um, being related to of use of some ART technologies. So we see here that the diffusion was remarkably different in different points of the income distribution. So the top 20% of the income distribution, those babies 
um, those mothers were much more likely to use ART than mothers in the bottom of the income distribution. We suspect that this is also happening in the US. I could not draw this graph for you in the United States um, uh, due to lack of data, but let me give you some comparative statistics. So in 2018, the CDC reports that 2% uh, uh, of all births in the US uh, were attributable to some use of assisted reproductive technology, but there are remarkable differences across different states, which also have different uh, average incomes, which probably suggests that the pattern in the United States looks something like that or potentially starker. So if we make a comparison of these two curves for the Swedish population at different points in the income distribution and compare them to the US states, the top line of the higher income uh, population in Sweden looks like Massachusetts, while the, um, uh, while the bottom line would have looked, if we drew it, for New Mexico, which is the lowest rate of ART use in the United States, would have been at about 0.5%. So this would have been much lower than the uh, uh, bottom quintile of the income distribution in Sweden. So the question is, um, what drives the, both the level of adoption of medical technologies as well as these differences that we observe by income? And there are many factors, many of which we'll discuss today. So I'm going to start with showing you evidence on one factor that I think is particularly important, and that is the role of health insurance, which obviously controls uh, prices that patients have to pay, or whether they can access technology at all, but also prices that they have to pay for any given technology. Um, so this graph, um, for the same, to continue with the same example for in our Swedish context, shows you very clearly the, uh, uh, the, the importance of insurance coverage as the driver of medical technology take up. So this is drawn for the full population. We can do this for different um, parts of the population by income, and we see that the differences are starker in uh, lower income households. What you see in this graph is the number of women um, on the, the left-hand side y-axis y is the number of women in each month, so each bar represents a month, who initiated an IVF cycle. In the X, on the x-axis, you see um, the number of months that these women um, are, the age of these women in, in the number of months relative to the threshold of eligibility for insurance coverage in the Swedish public insurance system for IVF. So the Swedish public insurance system, as opposed to California, covers IVF uh, up to three IVF cycles. And, uh, but the coverage uh, depends not on your income, but it does depend on your age. And so to the left of this drop, to the left of the zero, if you, can see, if you cannot see the zero if it's too small, you hopefully can see the, the big drop where, uh, where the zero is. To the left of the zero, people are eligible for um, health insurance coverage because they're younger then the different th sort of thresholds vary a little bit across the country, but they're around 39 uh, to 40 years old. So to the left, women are covered by health insurance, and to the right, they age out of health insurance coverage. And what we uh, can clearly see here is that the number of women, which is in the dark gray bars, while the number of uh, births is in the light gray bars, drops starkly at the point of insurance coverage. So women who do not receive health insurance coverage for um, IVF in Sweden, um, and their price for one IVF cycle at that point goes up from about $300 to $3,500, which I should say separately is about five, uh, five times smaller uh, than the price of an IVF cycle in the US. Um, so this price goes up by 10% and the drop in use is about 50%. If we draw this by different points in the income distribution, we see that this drop is larger in lower income households because certainly $3,500 represents a bigger amount for them. So what do, does all of this, so to, to sort of summarize, and you know, this specific project is a big project that I could uh, continue talking for another, uh, about for another hour, but what I hope this very specific example in the Swedish context show us um, uh, is sort of three things. One is we need better data in the US to actually figure out what's going on in the US. Um, two is that technological diffusion is very unequal at different points in the socioeconomic spectrum and likely drives differences in health that we observe at the population level. And three, health insurance plays a very important role in, in uh, driving adoption of new medical technologies as well as the differences, differential rates of adoption across different points in the income distribution. Um, and then I'm going to turn back to, to Michelle to introduce the next speaker, thank you.
Thank you so much, Dr. Pelyakova, for that very sobering view of the effect of inequality. Um, on the same theme, I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Stacy Dusatzina, who's one of the nation's experts in the emerging field of pharmaco equity, uh, the question of how we ensure equitable access to prescription drugs uh, uh, in light of their very high costs. Uh, she is a health services researcher by training, and she's associate professor of health policy and the Ingram Associate Professor of Cancer Research at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, her work has contributed some of the really crucial studies underpinning um, major public policies to support the affordability of prescription drugs, including uh, reforms in the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act. Um, she's also a population health scientist and a pharmacoepidemiologist who specializes in big data informatics. Um, and finally, she's a member of the Medicare uh, Payment Advisory Commission. Uh, Dr. Duzetzina, thank you so much for joining us. So um, I think I have a perfect segue from the past, uh, the last talk about insurance is necessary. Um, what I want to talk about is how it is necessary but insufficient as we think about access to things like prescription drugs. And I'm specifically wanting to talk about prescription drug access under the Medicare program and for people needing high cost drugs for treating cancer as just an example of where our policies may not be enough even when we think we have the right policies in place. So under the Medicare Part D program, access to cancer drugs is mandatory. So all Medicare formularies must cover all cancer drugs. So coverage, great start. However, there is no mandate related to affordability and accessibility. And so what has happened over time is that plans have offered all of these drugs, but at completely unaffordable prices. So if you don't spend all of your time thinking about prescription drugs and cancer treatments like I do, you might not know that most of them cost nearly $150,000 for an annual course of treatment if you took them as prescribed. And so, when you think about what does the problem with coverage but not thinking about affordability mean, what it means is that people have to pay a percentage of that drug's price with every fill. And for Medicare beneficiaries today, that means your first fill could cost you over $3,000 out of pocket for just one month of treatment. And so I think it's important to think about how our policies are set up in a way that maybe it sounds like you should have access, but you don't. Um, you know, the other thing that I think you could think about is, like, how do we solve this problem? Well, one easy fix is just improve insurance coverage, right? Like, make the benefit more generous. But that costs something, and it costs something to many beneficiaries when we do that, so there's always a trade-off. Uh, we could also pay less for technology, which is probably a very unpopular after the last panel. Um, but, you know, I think this is the tension we're dealing with, is everyone wants a premium for their product, and we want innovative drugs and things that will help people. So one of the things I think is really important for people who work in this space and think about how do we improve access, improve equity, like get the best drugs to people, is to think about how do we generate the information we need to change policy, and how do we know who's being harmed today? So I think that there are a couple of things that we should keep in mind. Uh, one is that I think we have to deeply understand the policies that we're studying and their intended and unintended consequences. Um, as somebody who has spent the better part of a decade studying mostly Medicare Part D, I can say that even one policy can be very complicated in a way that you may not fully understand how it works until you just deeply know it. Um, and so I think that, uh, I think one of the comments that uh, Dr. Rose made was like parachuting into an area and doing a study. It's dangerous because you're producing evidence that policymakers may look at and then not understand how to make a policy change that matters and fixes the problem. Another thing that I think is important is knowing your biases and knowing the biases that are inherent in some of the work that we do because of the data sources we use. Um, Maria is exactly right. Uh, we have unfortunate problems of not having the data that we want to answer questions that we know we need to answer often. So we make do with things like 
administrative claims data, um, and other sources that can be somewhat problematic. Uh, for example, if you ask the question about how does specialty drug or cancer drug access look and are there disparities in access to cancer drugs for Medicare beneficiaries, and you start by asking that by looking at people who have filled a cancer drug, which is very common, you have now conditioned on access. So that person had to pay $3,000 to start the treatment. And then when you look at disparities within those groups, you're looking at a really different population than who you might mean to look at. So I think we have to kind of recognize these biases. Um, you could back up and you could ask a question like who's getting prescribed the drug? But that even has biases because we know that some patients, because of judgments about who they are and their ability to afford treatment, might never have a prescription written. So we have to think about how biases enter the system and how we may be answering questions in a way that maybe is missing groups of people that we really care about. And finally, I think we really have to wrestle with the trade-offs. Um, this should be pretty obvious to those of you who do policy work. Um, there are always unintended consequences. And I think there are also important trade-offs. If we pay less for technologies, do we get less innovative treatments in the future? But if we pay too much today, can we basically shut other people out? So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today and to be able to share some thoughts on this important topic. I look forward to a robust discussion. Thank you so much. Well, we're gonna turn from academic perspectives to industry perspectives now. So we've heard a lot about the role that public policies can play in connecting people to therapeutics. Um, but what about private organizations' policies, particularly in a free market economy where for-profit corporations are um, largely responsible for managing our healthcare system? Um, what obligations, what tools do they have to better extend the equity of technological innovations? Um, to begin that discussion, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Nicole Cooper, who is a health policy expert by training, and she's currently Senior Vice President of Health Equity Strategic Partnerships at United Health Group and helps to lead the National United Health Group Office of Health Equity. She formerly served as the head of healthcare policy at Lyft, as well as vice president of corporate social responsibility at United Healthcare. And prior to that, she served in the Obama administration as part of the HHS team responsible for implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So she really combines this vast experience with a deep commitment to health equity and a uniquely large and powerful national platform. I'm very interested in what she has to, say, to share with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Good afternoon, everyone. It's not lost on me that we're the last panel before the ending reception. Um, so very excited to be with you all this afternoon and to get the introduction, uh, or rather the invitation. And um, don't, uh, I don't take lightly that I'm representing industry, if you will, um, but I'm nonetheless very excited to, to be here and be part of this discussion. So um, I wanna start out by sharing that, you know, I have the, the pleasure of leading uh, a national office of health equity that's been newly uh, reestablished within United Health Group. Um, and I get to work every day alongside uh, a set of um, passionate uh, teammates and colleagues, really, who are committed to better meeting consumer needs, uh, thinking about how our, our, our large enterprise, if you will, can better collaborate across our business and um, really partner deeply across the U.S. healthcare system for the greater good. Um, so while uh, we do that, really, while also being uh, focused on intentionally using technology to make healthcare more simple and more easy to navigate, which is no small feat, as we all know, and has been discussed uh, extensively today. But there is still so much work to be done. So um, with all the things I'm going to share today, please don't um, think that I'm naive enough to know that, that we've solved or think that we've solved it. We, we definitely have not. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really excited that you all are having this symposium today focused on uh, public policy and the intersection of healthcare and, um, and health equity. So I wanna start out really today by talking about why I'm especially passionate about this topic. 
Um, much like a previous panelist, um, I have pers personal and firsthand experience navigating the U.S. healthcare safety net. I grew up receiving Medicaid coverage, growing up in uh, inner city Washington, D.C. At times, we got food from food banks. Uh, so this, this is real for me. This is not theoretical. Um, uh, uh, I say that respectfully. Uh, uh, but this is, this, is, this is meaningful to me. This is about my family and families that are in the neighborhood that I grew up in, in inner city D.C. And so this is also professional for me in that, uh, as was described, I worked uh, throughout my career to really help improve public insurance coverage programs and really our ability to more meaningfully address health holistically and to advance health equity for years. And I appreciate the emphasis from the previous panel around the researchers who've long been studying health inequities uh, and the time and the moment that we're in now where more, resource, more resources excuse me, are finally being um, shared and poured into uh, uh, this, this field, if you will. So now I'd like to talk, learn more about you all. So I said we were the end, so what, do I, what am I gonna do about that? I want you all to play a little game with me. Raise your hand if you're a student. Great, uh, and I recognize that there are many people joining us online, so raise your hand. Um, I used to be one of you. I used to be an overzealous health policy student studying at the master's and doctoral level thinking, what is the job market gonna look like? What kind of job am I gonna have? I wanna do social justice. I wanna maybe work for a payer. How can I? Hopefully I'm uh, showing you all that it's possible, right, to, to work within industry and do, do good and do public health work um, specifically. Um, secondly, who, who's a professor in the room? Lots of professors, of course. Economists, please raise your hands. Lawyers, great. Who here does work that directly impacts health equity? That should be everybody in the room, everyone watching, right? Trick question. So thank you for playing the game. One, I wanted to get us engaged and moving before uh, we, we close out the symposium today. But secondly, I truly wanted to do that to show we all come to this work with different journeys um, and uh, certainly with different sectors represented, uh, different disciplines, but it will take all of us to advance health equity both within the U.S. and globally. And that's work that I'm sure we all take very seriously. So uh, I was asked today to really talk concretely around how public policies affect health equity overall and specifically how payers like United Healthcare um, are really uh, and ensure that through interacting with public policies, we can help to provide more broad and more equitable access to innovative medical technologies and treatments. So I'm gonna to try to do that, but I'm not gonna to talk too fast. I'm gonna work on that. So for the purposes of my talk today, I wanna to talk about big P public policies, if you will, set by the federal government, state governments. I also wanna talk about small P policies uh, that we get to set and implement within United Health Group, United Healthcare, and at Optum uh, at national scale um, through the many uh, products and services and benefits that we provide to millions of Americans each day. So uh, I also wanna briefly take a step back um, as was taught to me by my, uh, my professors uh, and, and those who taught me in our field to really start with, with where I'm coming from, which is the framing of, that the CDC has given us for what health equity is. Um, and and uh, I often give this in talks and really, I know you all know this, so I'm gonna be brief, but really hang in there with me, right? The CDC definition is based on uh, referring to a state where everyone, literally everyone in a given society has a fair and just opportunity to achieve their full health potential. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. That's my guiding light for the work that I get uh, every day to do that I have the privilege of doing really in helping to lead the United Health Group Office of Health Equity and the many partnerships that we have across the country. So if we use that definition, it's very clear, obviously, that in the U.S. context, we're very far from that desired state uh, in the health care or the well care system that we have uh, and how it's um, uh, structured, financed, uh, and distributed, uh, the topic here today. Um, but at United Health Group, uh, as a very large payer uh, and provider in, in this country, uh, we're working every day to help people live healthier lives and to help make the health system work better for everyone. And that's our official our corporate mission and mantra, if you will. And so I wanna underscore this part around everyone. Um, and that's no small feat in trying to ensure that everyone uh, has better health care um, and health outcomes uh, largely. So I'm certain that all of us within the healthcare policy sphere have increasing, increasingly been confronted throughout the COVID pandemic with the reality that to truly understand how to better finance and deliver healthcare innovations equitably, we have to fix certain gaps. Uh, and there, to some um, uh, in other countries, right, they, they certainly appear to be basic gaps, but they're gaps that we've just not fixed in this country, um, despite having, of course, the Medicare and 
Medicaid arms of coverage uh, for, for public options, if you will. And so I want to give you all some solid examples today of what we're doing and what we're learning at United Health Group uh, as both a provider of Medicaid, Medicare coverage, and also uh, commercial uh, uh, lines of insurance. And so we have the opportunity through United Health Group really to address today's challenges through the impact of our collective work across our company, again, including United Healthcare and our Optum businesses, uh, and through uh, living out our mission, which I've already shared. So what does that exactly mean? Hopefully you're thinking that now. Like, what, what is she talking about? What are they doing? Um, so I'm, I'm proud that I have some good stuff to talk about today um, and uh, some solid examples that I, I really hope we get to have a much more robust discussion around. So we're doing the work. Uh, we most recently actually released what we call a path forward, which offers refreshed perspectives on and a, a specific set of policy solutions for modernizing the US healthcare system, um, really to do three things. And I have my copy of the path forward. It's an actual physical document. Uh, it's relatively brief, but it does lay out uh, specific uh, policy uh, perspectives, if you will, that we share as a company and what we believe it will take to improve uh, the US healthcare system to achieve more universal coverage uh, and many other important aims that we've not yet achieved, achieved as a system. But uh, we also get at, in this document, the path forward uh, on unitedforaction.com uh, is uh, around making healthcare much more affordable by accelerating value-based care, using high-value sites of service for care, reforming prescription drug pricing, which my new friend Stacy uh, will talk much more about and has already teed us up on. Uh, and then also as a third pillar, um, the path forward discusses at length how United Health Group wants wants us for the greater good to, to better transform healthcare experiences by focusing on equity, addressing disparities, and expanding and diversifying the healthcare workforce, which is also a topic that has come up today, and I'm, I'm glad that it did by our keynote speaker uh, earlier in the day. These are all quite important policy topics that I know are top of mind these days for all of you all, issues that you study and know deeply. So um, as part of our ongoing efforts to improve access to and, and to make various emergency use prescription jobs much more affordable across the country, in July of this year, we actually announced a national zero dollar uh, copay initiative that begins January 1, 2023, um, for certain preferred life saving prescription drugs, which includes zero dollar copay for any United Healthcare members who need insulin. Uh, so we're very proud of that. Uh, we also uh, in, included in this initiative um, that we would provide zero dollar copays uh, for EpiPens for people with severe allergic reactions, uh, uh, zero dollar copays for albuterol for those at risk for acute asthma attacks. Uh, and uh, naloxone is also uh, a very important emergency use drug that we now cover, zero, will soon begin covering at a zero dollar copay, a drug that we know, of course, is critical for the prevention of opi opioid overdose, a topic that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about today, but certainly has uh, lots of inequity embedded. And if we look at the data on, on who uh, overdoses on um, uh, opioids in this country based on income, race, et cetera. So at United Health Group, we're also collaborating with Walmart Health um, in a newly announced partnership. Maybe you saw it about four weeks ago. If not, I can tell you all about it, uh, where we're focusing on providing more uh, high quality, affordable health care in various communities across the country over the next 10 years in direct partnership with Walmart Health at their clinic sites. And, um, uh, very excited about this in particular because 90% of uh, people in this country live within 10 miles of a, of a Walmart store uh, and very excited about uh, working with them as they scale up Walmart health uh, clinics. So this collaboration as planned will bring together the, collab the collective clinical expertise of both of our companies uh, to ensure that people get the right care at the right time within, right within their communities, um, and it's a, it, which is a major challenge, as we well know, um, even for people who have sources of public coverage. So we, we're starting out and looking at uh, the needs of Medicare Advantage populations in particular with this partnership with Walmart Health over the next 10 years. Um, and I also want to highlight that um, back in June of this year, we announced that at United Health Group, we were making a $100 uh, $100 million commitment over the next 10 years to diversify the healthcare workforce, looking at uh, and supporting specifically the educations of underrepresented students who are um, entering and pursuing uh, professions 
uh, and, and uh, degrees, if you will, uh, within primary care and behavioral health care. And we know that's uh, an essential, essential ingredient uh, to improving the U.S. healthcare system. Um, thinking about the diversity in this room today, right? Um, and, and we have to be critical of ourselves within the healthcare workforce generally and saying who's left out, whose perspectives are we not getting? Um, and so we're very excited about furthering um, uh, our commitment to diversifying the U.S. healthcare workforce through this $100 million um, commitment. Um, and thinking about the next generation of U.S. healthcare workers and what we've learned from the pandemic. And, and um, it's so exciting and, and ripe for hopefully a ton of innovation, really. Um, as we know that the better a patient is understood, the better they'll be treated. All right, That's, um, we all know that. Um, so that said, I also want to share with you all a few more quick examples of how we are thinking about um, our benefits and um, how what it means to be a United Healthcare member and what you um, can look to continue receiving. Uh, and I'll just really quickly, because they're telling me to wrap it up, uh, talk about the United Healthcare My Community Connections program, where we've developed and are deploying an evidence-based social determinants of health screening strategy, uh, where we identify United Healthcare members that have complex uh, health and social needs, and we work to address those needs uh, through adopting uh, a national um, a part protocol. Um, and I know that was discussed earlier. What would it look like if every system and every payer develops their own ways of assessing social needs? And we're not doing that. We're utilizing uh, the evidence for, for um, nationally adopted uh, social screenings. We're also working on what we call the House Calls Program, uh, where we're providing critical in-home primary care and clinical visits um, to uh, uh, vulnerable seniors in particular, thinking about their medical needs, their pharmacy needs, their behavioral health and social needs, and each of these visit, visits, we're proud to say, last on average 45 to 60 minutes, which is more than double um, the time that a senior spends in a primary care visit um, uh, in office, if you will. So we're coming into their homes. We're already seeing uh, decreases in hospitalizations of the members who are touched by the house clause program and also um, uh, increases in uh, physician visits thereafter, which we're also proud to track. We, we're proud of the fact that we're, we're increasing uh, their utilization in more uh, appropriate sites of care after uh, we see them first in their homes. Uh, and we're also really proud that we're investing in housing, um, thinking about the role that payers have to play in stabilizing the many social insecurities of our members. Um, and to date, we've actually committed over $800 million um, to uh, fund affordable housing units, 20,000 affordable housing units um, in dozens of states across the country. Uh, we're thinking about the needs of people with disabilities, uh, uh, veterans, uh, families, single moms, et cetera. Very excited about that, and I, hopefully we'll talk much more about that. And then if I had more time, I'd talk about telehealth and what we've done. But I'll leave you with the fact that um, United Healthcare, through what we've seen with the overnight switch and needing to get people uh, high quality and efficient means of um, uh, accessing care through telehealth and digital health tools that we have uh, set a policy for a big, uh, a small p policy, if you will, um, that uh, for all of our members, um, we have made it uh, permanent um, part of our benefit packages that even after the COVID-19 uh, public health emergency ends uh, as designated by the federal government, we will continue supporting and reimbursing for telehealth visits. Um, and uh, really want to leave you with uh, this, uh, hopefully, um, summary, right, that, that we're doing, we see this as our responsibility in improving population health at scale and directly addressing health inequities uh, for racial and ethnic minorities, um, for gender minorities, people with disabilities, um, and many, many others who find themselves at, at intersections um, that leave them ripe for, um, for needing a little more help. Um, and for uh, and where where many other parts of the healthcare system and social care systems uh, largely have left them behind, so we take this work very seriously around advancing uh, health equity, and it's it's certainly hard work, uh, but work that we're committed to doing. So thank you. Well, there's just so much there that we could talk about in Q and A, from uh, work on social determinants to cost sharing connector program. So just as a reminder that if you'd like to participate in the Q&A, there's a QR code that you can use or you can click on the link on the event website. We'd love to get more of your questions in. Um, but for now, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our last speaker, Dr. Vindal Washington. Uh, he is a physician by training. He also is training in healthcare management. And he is the chief clinical officer of the Verily Health Platforms Group and the CEO of Onduo. Um, his work focuses on developing tools and platforms for improving patient health outcomes and reducing the costs of care. 
Um, his prior experience includes stints as the chief medical officer at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Louisiana, as well as our nation's national coordinator for health information technology. I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Vindell on a small project for Verily, and what really strikes me about him is that not only does he have unbelievable expertise, but he truly has an innovator's curiosity about other people's perspectives and other people's needs, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to say today. Thank you so much. Well, first, thanks to Michelle for that kind introduction. I want to talk with the group today really around one of the areas of that I think is a significant barrier to the adoption of innovation in the communities that we care about, communities that are under stress, and that's trust. Before, before I go there, I want to go half a step back to the panel that left earlier. So um, Verily and Verily Health Platforms is an alphabet company, and so one of the questions before is why does a company like Google even care about this particular topic, health equity? So the first thing I would say to you is Silicon Valley cares about it because it's an ethical thing, it's the right thing to do. But I will also, in all transparency, give you the story that happened to me at Blue Cross of Louisiana. The other reason companies care about it is math. What I mean by that is we were in one of those value programs at Blue Cross of Louisiana, and the goal there was to have a five-star Medicare Advantage program. And that is achieved by having certain measurements of quality among the members that you serve. Turns out, in a state like mine, Louisiana, the health disparities are so great, the math does not allow you to become a five-star program if you choose to ignore communities under stress. 31% of Louisiana residents are African American. The uh, median income is uh, 48th in the country. It's just impossible if you're gonna ignore that as a, as a reason. So it's, it's an important thing from an ethical perspective, but it's also a math thing. I often start some of these discussions around health equity by giving a list of why should we care? How, how high is the fire under the burning platform that we're talking about? And I will tell you, over the past 20 years, it's been really disappointing because it is so easy to populate my list. I'll give you a few highlights before we dive into the topic around of trust. Um, I left Louisiana, uh, that, that job, in 2019. In 2018, it was the case that if you're an African-American mother in Louisiana giving birth, you had a four times higher likelihood of dying in childbirth four times. Um, a couple of years earlier, HHS did a series of data reports on asthma. Turns out that there's a 10 times higher death rate in non-Hispanic and uh, African-American communities versus non-Hispanic white kids. One of those areas that should be an area of celebration is cardiovascular care. For, for goodness sake, we're at Stanford here today. Since 1950, it's one of the largest improvements in healthcare over that entire period of time. People don't die of heart attacks in nearly the numbers that they did in 1950. All the innovations that you read about, it's, it's a great story to tell. But it also turns out that between 1950 and now, the difference in deaths between African Americans and whites in this country from cardiovascular disease is unchanged unchanged since 1950. It's not just the outcomes that are bad. If you say, why are, these, why are these things happening? Why are those outcomes so poor? And we had a great discussion earlier about some of the systemic systems that are in place. Sometimes when I give these talks, I'm able to sort of look out in the audience and say, when we talk about things like systemic structures, and push the audience and find out that often these things exist in their institutions. And so one that I like to talk about is the measurement of kidney function, this idea of looking at glomerular filtration rates and deciding whether or not you, for example, may be a candidate for a transplant, et cetera. Um, so I did my little research before coming today. Turns out I can't say that at Stanford, but I will tell you that you changed your policy on it in November of 2021. And so in the 70s, we found out for sure that this idea of African Americans having higher muscle mass and therefore spilling more um, um, protein in their urine 
and sort of changing their ranking on when it was time that they could actually get a transplant was something that had no basis in science, a couple of bad studies. But we carried that from 1970 until the 2020s in many institutions. And I can still go to places and have this discussion and ask people to go to their hospital and look, and there's a little notation that says AA by the side. So it's not just bias in terms of delivery, and it's not just things like social determinants that point out those differences. Those are super important. But I want to talk about something entirely different. I want to talk about trust. And what I would say to you about trust is that it is an absolutely necessary component of delivering innovation to the communities we're trying to serve. Absolutely necessary. And I would also say to you, trust is really built on a series of promises kept. Trust is built on a series of promises kept. And what I mean by that is it's impossible to say, today I'm gonna to show up today in my white coat, I'm gonna sit you down in a chair, I'm gonna tell you about all the dangers of COVID and you're gonna hop up and get your COVID vaccination. If I have not established the right to sit across from you and have you believe that I have your best interest in mind. So this is not a technology portion of the talk, but I think it's super important when you're talking about the adoption of the new technologies that we put on the table. We ask those questions, what's wrong with that community? The question should be, why have we not engendered the amount of trust to allow us to deliver care in that community? I wanna tell a little bit of a personal story about this. Um, I live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, it's sort of a relatively short drive from Baton Rouge, less than a few hours to get to Tuskegee, Alabama. So there's probably at a school like this, not a person in this auditorium that doesn't know about the Tuskegee syphilis experience. Probably not experiment, probably not a person in here. But I wanna point out a few things to you. So if you talk about what's going on in the Mississippi Delta, um, the study went on, started in 1932. There's probably someone in the room I'll ask the question that can tell me when that study ended. Anybody have any idea when the study ended? 1972. And I know I have all this sort of gray hair on my beard, but I was in primary school in 1972. Which means if you're going into the Mississippi Delta and you want to talk about why those institutions should have the right to talk about new medicines, new vaccines, new interventions. The fact of the matter is, it's not a hypothetical discussion for them. There's someone in their family, there's someone in their household, they know that as a firsthand experience. So what do you do as an institution to change that? I would say the only way you do that is you improve those relationships one small step at a time. It's built over time, and it's built with these outreach efforts. So I don't think, uh, it was very interesting um, today to hear the, the stories about um, research in particular, and um, the idea that trust could be overcome in circumstances. I'm not saying that that's not the case. I'm just pointing out that there's heavy lifting to be done. So I think that there are sort of four categories that we think about a lot at um, Verily Health platforms about how you should approach this work four categories of things. The first is pretty simple, you gotta do the right thing. So if after something like years and decades of bad experiences, you're not continuing to move that ball forward, you're not continuing to do the right thing, you're not continuing to have things be different than the day before, you can't expect that that trust barrier is gonna be overcome and that people are gonna receive you differently than they would in other experiences, that's the first thing. The second is, there's no such thing as sort of a colorblind approach to healthcare. So I'm old enough, to, uh, graduated med school too many years ago, and at the time we talked a lot about sort of a colorblind distribution of care, the fact that we were gonna overlook those items. It turns out it's probably the opposite. If you don't measure, if you don't look, you won't find and you won't improve. So what you have to do is you have to measure, and you have to measure unflinchingly. So it is often not gonna be pretty what you find, but if you're looking to decrease the barriers for accepting innovation, if you're looking to turn the tide around health equity, you better measure, you better look hard, and you better look all the places you know how to look. The third, um, which I think really goes to the heart of some of the discussions today is, is two parts in my mind. The first is a degree of humility. 
So it was talked about in the innovation panel earlier before ours. But if you walk into a community with the idea that you know all that exists and all that needs to be done in that community, you often find yourself on the wrong side of decision making going forward. So I joke with people, I grew up in a town that's super tiny. It's a town that's called Woodford, Virginia. It's so small that when I went to college, I moved when people asked me where I was from to the next closest town, which was Bowling Green, Virginia. And when I went to, college, when I went to um, graduate school, I actually moved to Fredericksburg, Virginia. Guess what, now that we're in California, I'm from Washington, DC, just like my colleague. <laughs> but the point of the matter is a guy who's from Woodford, Virginia has no clue of all that is needed to be done in Oakland, California. And it doesn't matter that my skin is brown. So humility is a critical aspect of how we do this and move this forward. The second part of it is you, have, you need to seek allies and trusted members within communities. And so a lot of the work, and I'm super ex interested in how this sort of CMS reach model is going to pan out at the, as their new ACO work, because if you take the step back and you say part of this structure is that we are not going to go into these sort of disease management and, and movement scenarios believing that we have all the tools that are necessary, that we can do this without the communities we, just, we serve in this care delivery model. I think that's a critical element. And then the last thing I'll say about this is we need patience. So if it took 50 years of the sort of post-Tuskegee sort of uh, effort in, uh, in, the, um, in, the, in, in that area of the country, um, in the Mississippi Delta, and hundreds of years of sort of systemic structure around it, I would say we shouldn't go faint in the effort. It is absolutely worth the work and I think it's something we can actually do if we put our elbows and arms together and move forward in. So thank you for the time today. Thank you so much. So we're now gonna move into our Q&A portion um, and I, I'm getting uh, questions up here in real time so please keep them coming. Um, let, me, let me start just by picking up on something that, that you said uh, about measurement that, you know, and also I think most of the speakers made this point in one way or another that we can't fix what we can't measure and so we have to measure unflinchingly. Um, for each of you, if you could snap your fingers and have one thing measured well that isn't, what would it be and why would that be the thing that would really help move the ball forward in improving health equity? Maybe we can just go down the line here starting with Dr. Polyakova. Um, Sure, I, I mean, I think the main thing that is doable in the United States is, is, is linking different measurements that we have. So we have measure, very good measurement of healthcare use, we have very good measurement of income, we don't have measurement of health over time. So sort of being more comprehensive and um, enabling people to both see what else is going on outside of the medical world for people in their families and in their work lives, as well as how people's health evolves over time would be an enorm enormous contribution to the US research. I think that question is impossible. <laughs> um, but I, you know, aside from just the data elements that we tend to think of, you know, often I think it's some of those things from the clinical encounter, maybe it gets a little bit to this trust aspect, but also like we know that patients' preferences and like there's so many things that go into like why you do or do not receive a healthcare service and we don't do a good job of measuring or understanding those things and sometimes they're not even things that are being stated, right? They're just things that are like in your mind as the person who needs to do, you know, whatever is being asked. And so I think if we, spent more time trying to really understand what is happening between, in my case, prescribers and patients in these decisions to use a drug, to prescribe a drug, or to not you know, do any of those things, I think that would be amazingly helpful. So I wanna pick up on a theme um, from Dr. Maria, which we, I could tell what you were gonna say based on your talk, but I wanna echo that um, from where I sit that we need to uh, do much, much better measurement around broader social care um, needs and inequities. And so that would take better linking, um, more holistic data sets that get at, like you said, income, health outcomes, social care outcomes. Um, and uh, that's at the mic macro level. Uh, at the micro level, that would mean then, um, and thinking about your world, Dr. Uh, Stacy, you know, for the Medicare Advantage program uh, in particular, 
we would then have STARS um, quality metrics, as you said, Dr. Washington, um, that get at um, health inequities and social needs. Um, for, uh, we are, um, uh, have prioritized within United Health Group that there is a definite need to change the policies such that um, Medicare Advantage plans, including ours, um, have uh, distinct quality metrics and measures that um, get at how good we are at addressing social needs. Um, at present, those, those measure, measures don't exist. So at a micro level, that's what I would like to see better measured. Yeah, this is good to be last on this one because all the good answers are in play. Um, I would just say, I'll just add to something that uh, Stacy said. I would say we measure best things that help us get paid in healthcare more broadly. So we have talks. We know that 70, 80% of our health status is determined by other things, but we often don't measure or track or link those things. Well, I hope you all become czars of <laughs> measurement. Those are all fantastic ideas. So um, let, me, let me relay an audience question for Dr. Cooper. So United, you said, is investing in affordable housing, which is really extraordinary. What are your thoughts about the concept of, um, of physicians prescribing other uh, social needs, food, income support, uh, et cetera, to patients? Is that, what, what's, what is the limit of a payer's responsibility there? And is there a way to sort of cast that that would be palatable to key stakeholders? Sure. Um, so this came up, I believe, in uh, the very first panel around the use of ICD-10 codes, Z codes, as they're called, um, which really get at allowing um, healthcare providers to better measure and do something with, um, if you will, the screening outcomes once it's determined that a patient has um, a social need. Um, and so I have... Two answers. One comes from my Lyft healthcare hat that I previously wore, which is uh, we were um, fiercely d d uh, uh, working to, to innovate uh, the medical transportation sector. We can talk about that uh, and during the reception. It's a broken system, uh, spoiler alert. Uh, but uh, what we did was uh, work to partner um, uh, in a first of its kind partnership with Epic, such that um, providers across the country um, could uh, roll out a form of Epic that had an actual button within a discharge summary to say, once a provider, discharge nurse, like you said, a doctor, uh, any, any member of the healthcare system uh, working to actively discharge someone from an emergency uh, room um, could say, oh, it, it, we found that you have a medical transportation need. We can now hail a Lyft ride through our partnership with Lyft Healthcare to get you wherever you need to be. I was gonna say home, but for many most vulnerable populations and patients, it's not home. It's uh, to the next site, if you will, to get um, another need of service. So that is uh, one answer. I was gonna share another, but I'll, I'll stop there. So here's a question I think is, is best addressed to both Dr. Polyakova and Dr. Dusatsina. Are there opportunities to learn from other systems, whether abroad, in, in the case of your Scandinavia research, or in the US, for example, the VA, where, um, where financial barriers to treatment are less prevalent, about how important financial barriers are versus other non-financial costs of obtaining treatments and technologies. What, 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 what do we know, what can we learn from those systems, or maybe what, what's the limit of what we can learn from other systems? Um, so that's a great question, and there has been some excellent research in the pharmacoequity context by uh, Dr. Utibi Essien on this question, and trying to dig into things like the inequities in receipt of anticoagulants. And so he's looked at this across Medicare, but also in the VA, where you can stabilize the out-of-pocket cost, and those questions and try to look at really that what is the prescribing difference that's happening that might explain some of the differences in how people receive treatment. And he has found that in the VA context that black patients are more likely to get some of the older treatments rather than the newer treatments that have a better safety and effectiveness profile. So there are really good opportunities, I think, to try to standardize some elements that we know exist that cause variation that we're not exactly sure how to then interpret our results. You know, I think the other opportunity is even in the Medicare program, for example, we have, uh, we know that some beneficiaries have low income subsidies that make their costs very low. 
And you can look to see what is going on in differences between people who qualify for low-income subsidies, so you're stabilizing at least the income part of disparities that we know can tend to affect how people access care. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think this is a great question, a question I get a lot when I present work with Scandinavian data, and you know, people's usual response is like, well, everything is different in Sweden, so why do I care? where my Swedish cohort thinks, well, maybe I just care about Sweden uh, and not, you don't necessarily have to inform US policy. But I think what we can learn are sort of two things. One is, um, you know, the, the graph I was showing you of the differential diffusion of technology by income. In fact, that is happening in an environment where everyone has the same health insurance coverage, both for, uh, including for these IVF technologies. And so in some sense, you can think about this as giving you bounds of how much health insurance can really fix, right? So if you see, um, gradients in, in health with respect to income in contexts where you know that there is universal health insurance coverage, where there is really no financial differences in people's access, that in some sense gives you, you know, the upper bound of how much would we fix in some ways if we somehow magically implemented the same system. At the same time, uh, because we do find these differences even in the environments with universal health care, I think what we learn is that there are a lot of other factors that contribute to people's demand um, and utilization of healthcare, including, I think, trust is an incredibly important component, but also just knowledge and expertise of navigating the systems. And so that also gives us you know, some sense that there are also other things that we cannot quite fix by just you know, distributing health insurance and call, calling it a day. So on this question of trust, I'd like to come back to Dr. Washington. You know, um, I, I find myself often reacting to advice about how to engage communities and build trust with the sense that it, it sounds absolutely right and I'm still not sure exactly what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> so can, can you sort of share some, maybe some small concrete things that researchers, individual healthcare practitioners or others can do to start to build that series of promises kept and to get people to be willing to let us yeah. engage with them? I, th I think it's a super interesting question. And you might think this has never been done. It's never worked. Um, but it's amazing to me if you actually start to look um, across certain um, uh, what I would call mostly experiments. Um, there are a lot of great stories. Um, there's this group uh, that ran a, um, a, an outreach strategy called Project Brotherhood in so south of Chicago, where they essentially went into the community, asked questions about what people needed, and they redesigned primary care in that particular area. They had things like um, they changed what the doctors wore. They changed what, the, and this is all based on interviews. They had things where they had um, training and elements that were unrelated to healthcare, but kind of related to healthcare. They had peers coach one another about prostate um, uh, screening and colonoscopy screening, et cetera. And they had astronomical rates. Uh, this was um, also sponsored by Rush, but the money ran out. And so like part of the thing is, I think in a lot of areas like Project Brotherhood, we know kind of the kind of things that work. Uh, we know areas where community health workers, where they've been funded, do particularly well, where you actually get workers from the community to become those workers, as opposed to you know, sending a bunch of folks to parachute in. Um, but I think we've not really reached a point where we've made that long-term investment or strategy. But I do think that there's some examples we can learn from. Terrific. So I want to talk, uh, lastly, about um, cost sharing. So Dr. Cooper, you shared some um, really terrific initiatives to reduce patients' cost sharing for prescription drugs. As someone who spent a fortune on EpiPens and mm -hmm. is a United Health customer, <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. um, You're welcome. I want to <laughs> ask you, and, and I'd be interested in, in your perspectives as well as researchers who study health insurance coverage, um, how, how far should we take this initiative to eliminate patients' cost sharing? You know, because the healthcare market has been pushing us in the other direction, high deductible health plans, consumer-directed healthcare, giving patients more skin in the game. Is that vision incompatible with achieving health equity? That's a terrific question. I mean, when we look at the data, and it, it won't take a hard look to, to know, who um, a policy shift in ensuring that certain drugs have a zero dollar copay, who that's going to disproportionately affect, right? Um, it will be the most vulnerable, the most low income members that we have the privilege of serving. Um, and so the other sort of 
way of thinking about it is um, it's also the right thing to do because we know it will reduce costs, right? Um, how many um, tragic outcomes um, are, are the burden, if you will, of vulnerable populations because they lack access to these critical um, medications uh, like EpiPens and insulin, right? Um, the, um, the pandemic has shown, has shown us you know, that we, we must, we must center the vulnerable um, uh, moving forward or else we'll have more um, tragedy, more tragic outcomes, if you will. So um, not to belabor the point, but I'll just say, yes, more of this is coming. Um, and uh, certainly we hope that our industry will catch up uh, and continue to do the right thing um, in, um, in reducing cost sharing altogether. Can I share one quick comment on that? Sure. Um, we, we did a study at Blue Cross Louisiana. I think people understand just how cost sensitive people can be to co-pays co for chronic disease treatment. If the copay was more than $7, that's the point at which we could actually see people stop filling meds. So we're not actually, it doesn't have to be the $3,000 cancer drug. At seven bucks, people stop doing it. Mm -hmm. Anything that you would, you would add, Dr. Giusettina? You know, I, I think the one thing is, is that a lot of policy options that have been on the table over the last several years really focus on like insulin as a key motivating factor. So $35 insulin for everybody, or free insulin. And I think that is super important. Obviously, people need insulin to live. But there are lots of drugs that people need to live. And so I think that I always kind of look to think about, what about all of the other treatments that people need? And how do we get a solution that can be the net best solution so that you know if everybody has to pay a little and we get coverage that gets everyone's drugs covered, to me, that's the optimal solution. So you know, I think that that is always the tension. We want to help some populations. We want to help uh, people who have a big presence, but you know, the people who aren't at the table or aren't there to advocate for their conditions, uh, we don't want to miss them either. Dr. Polyakov, I'll give you the last word. Um, you know, an economist getting the last word on cost sharing is a dangerous thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I guess wearing the economist head, I mean, realistically, it's a trade-off, and it depends on how we as a society value uh, certain populations and, and their health and what else people may want to do with money instead of their drugs. In many, many data sets, we actually see that people would have preferred, for example, to get cash rather than getting health insurance or getting their drugs covered. And you know, many people will say, well, that's irrational. People don't understand that really the drug is much more important or health insurance is much more valuable. But in some sense, you know, do we decide that we know better or not? And, and so I guess I, I think there are two main things that we need as, as from the policy perspective to agree on. One is who decides, the policymaker or the consumer? How much do we trust people to know what they need and what they want most? And second, how do we aggregate all of these preferences and, and desires across very different people in the population, echoing your point that in some ways, you know, people have very different needs and how do we decide who needs what first? Well, I think that's a terrific place to stop. Please join me in thanking our fantastic panelists. <laughs>